This final session of the day, Cities as Global Actors in an Urban Century, and uh, we've invited uh, a new moder moderator for JMF, John Yearwood, world editor of the Miami Herald. John, where are you? I'm back here. Oh, uh, there you are. <laughs> if we're ready, I guess we'll get started. Uh, I wanted, we wanted to talk today about uh, what's happening throughout the world where we're seeing an increasing number of cities that are becoming global players. Uh, in city halls around the world, we're seeing uh, foreign policies uh, being conducted. And I guess one of the things we're going to find out is whether that's a good thing and whether or not the best place to run foreign policy is from City Hall, as well as what are some of the tensions that's creating with several central governments as cities increasingly become their own foreign policy players. I'm John Yearwood. I'm the world editor of the Miami Herald, and I'm also the host of World Desk, which is on the Miami Herald website, miamiherald.com. In addition to that, I also blog on World Impact, uh, World Dispatch, I'm sorry, at world, worldpress.com. So now that I've dispensed with the commercial, I guess we'll, uh, we'll get started. We have a, a, an amazingly interesting and learned panel to talk about the issues that, uh, that we're going to address on uh, talking about cities as global actors or global players. Let's start by talking about Lisbon. We have the deputy mayor of Lisbon with us, Graça uh, Fonseca, and uh, we'll start with her talking about whether in Lisbon, foreign policy is being done from the corridors of City Hall. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if the City Hall, but at least in streets. And that's also um, a place to do policy, and that's also a place to make politics. Um, I believe uh, that really cities are the next place where everything is going to happen. Uh, nowadays, more than half of the population lives in cities. Um, cities are the places where people live, where people work, where people start a company, where people have their uh, um, disagreements, their conflicts. So we, we have to think about cities as global actors or as global partners uh, in everything that's going to uh, make the change for the future. And that is something that really uh, will be the future, I'm convinced. Well, let's go on to Buenos Aires, which is uh, one of the largest and uh, admittedly most important cities in the world. I'm sure you would agree. And uh, we're going to talk about what's happening in Buenos Aires with one of the advisors to the mayor of uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, his name is um, Art, uh, I'm sorry, uh, with um, uh, Umberto. Uh, uh, with Norberto Pontirori uh, from uh, Buenos Aires. Let's talk about what's happening in Buenos Aires and whether or not, as I asked the, the deputy mayor of uh, Lisbon, whether in Buenos Aires, city is being done, I mean, uh, foreign policy is being done from the corridors of City Hall. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, let me say that uh, the answer, the short answer would be, would be yes. Uh, the, the city of uh, Buenos Aires is engaged in uh, several network uh, of cities today. Uh, and it has also been developing uh, since the last couple of decades, uh, Twin Sisters uh, Convenience. And uh, I believe that uh, the, the role of cities for the future, it's very important because uh, global talent today in the 21st century is migrating to cities and regions, not to countries. I mean, people is going to Bangalore, not to India. People is coming to Buenos Aires, not to Argentina, and the same will be uh, for several countries. So uh, I think that the, the, the role that cities are playing in the 21st century uh, in an information-based capitalism is uh, very important for the future. Now, Roberto, when the mayor turns to you and say, I need advice, on international affairs. What do you tell them? Very interesting question. Uh, the first thing to, to say uh, would be uh, that cities are not the, the traditional actors 
on international politics. Uh, international politics and the global governance system, if there is uh, such a thing, are overwhelmingly uh, organized around head of states, ministries of foreign affairs, central bankers. So uh, I believe that if we, if we think that we're living in a century like the one that is described by Farid Zakaria in, in the book, Post-American World, where you have the rise of the rest, meaning not only the rise of the rest of the countries, but the rise of the rest of the cities and the regions, because they are shaping international economy. So uh, my first advice would be, uh, you have to prepare to a world in which mayors and local parliaments are not the key actors, but there are some informal channels that uh, a lot of work is being done today. Uh, I mean by that, the, the, especially the, the city networks, where a lot of decision is being taking place, and sometimes in a more effective way than uh, in the organizations that are formed by national governments. I would, I would say that probably the best example of that would be uh, within the framework of uh, the Rio Plus 20 conference uh, a couple of months ago, uh, cities managed to achieve a compromise there where states failed to do so. Uh, 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 by, I think, would be uh, from here to 2018, uh, a reduction of uh, 1,300 uh, tons of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that that's uh, uh, just a little example of how cities are becoming uh, protagonists in the international arena. And I think that uh, mayors and, and local authorities, governors, of course, too, uh, should push and become militants of that cause internationally. I want to tell everyone and invite you to have your questions ready because I'd like to um, get you involved in this conversation very quickly. But before I do that, I want to ask a question of Grasa in Lisbon. Where do you think we're headed? To the United Nations of Cities? Yeah, that was my comment 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I was, I was uh, suggesting that maybe we could uh, start thinking about that. Uh, found the United Nations of Cities or uh, United Cities of the World, why not? I mean, in a few years, you'll have that. Uh, when you look at the, what's happening in all the cities in Europe at this point, in Athens, in Lisbon, in London, in Paris, I mean, in Madrid, you see that everything goes through cities. And that is very, very important to look at. We, we cannot ignore that because people, uh, like you were saying, people don't go to Portugal, people go to Lisbon. People don't work in Portugal, people work in Lisbon. And that is something that is very important. And at the local level, at the city level, you have a much higher percep perception of what people want, what people uh, would like to happen, what people are pushing forward to. And that is something that really, from someone that has been in the national level before and now is on a local level, um, it's, it's a huge difference. Uh, nowadays, I have a close per perception of what that people want, of that citizen want, and I didn't have before. And that is something that we have to think about it. The United Nations of Cities, that's interesting. I'm curious about anyone in the audience, whether you think that's a good idea or not. Uh, <laughs> do you think that that's necessary, that's needed, a, 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 whether it's an organization or at least a concept of the United Nations of Cities? Uh, anyone want to weigh in on that? at this point. <laughs> what, uh, I'm sorry, you wanted to say? Uh, if, you, if you allow me, I will make a comment on that. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a very well-renowned academic called uh, Benjamin Barber that has been playing with the idea of uh, uh, more than a, a United Nations of cities with a parliament of cities. Uh, or, or there are some other academics that are uh, playing also with the idea of uh, uh, a league of governors and of mayors. And I think it was the, the mayor of, uh, of Milan, uh, Leticia Moratti, in 2006, that for the first time talked about uh, a global federalism. Because, uh, as I was saying previously, these, uh, these uh, channels, these informal channels, uh, are doing a very good job, but I think there is uh, uh, needed within the, the traditional and the most formal channels of global governance that the cities could be able to raise their voice. I wanted to uh, bring um, uh, other actors into this uh, discussion, and I want to talk 
to uh, the chairman of Bottlesman, uh, Art Degrees. How do you think this will affect uh, the less affluent uh, citizens in many of these cities that are becoming increasingly global? Do you see many of the, uh, the less affluent in these cities benefiting from these uh, increasingly global policies? Yeah, well, first of all, we can say that the United Nation of Cities or the United Nations of Cities is a somewhat paradoxical because when we talk about nations, we talk about the counterparts of cities in many discussions nowadays. So maybe cities really can learn from each other. That is one process. And cities can unite to be a countervailing power to nations. And that is an important struggle. I think that uh, from a global perspective, as we study in the Bertelsmann uh, Stiftung in Germany, we see that the real global themes, like environment, and the harmony between economy and environment. Second, social inclusion, tackling inequalities. And thirdly, the aging of societies, because cities will be aging maybe even more rapidly than, than, urban area, than uh, rural areas in the future. All these themes can be dealt with, with, uh, dealt with better if cities would have the authority, the means to do that. Example, environment. The whole idea of what do you use for your transportation and how do you organize the recycling of waste. Can a nation do it? No. Can a city do it? Yes. What about tackling inequalities? Can a nation do it? No. Can a city do it? Yes. How to bring together. So the real opportunity, the real challenge now is how to organize the governance in a way that is most fit and it should be new. In a, in a fit that, uh, that, 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 got, that cities can really solve these problems. I mean, you've been involved with working with cities for a long time. What's the solution? How should they do it? They should do it by building new means, new means of democracy. And that is where we as Bertelsmann also participate in pilots. Because we see that the idea to go f uh, for a vote every four years, be it on a city council or a national council, is totally an outdated form of democracy. In order to tackle these questions, you have to involve citizens in real discussions and then in smaller groups so that they can together also take responsibility what to do in their direct environment, what to do in their cities, and how to build a community. Sometimes people think, oh, cities are bigger and bigger. And that's true. Because in 50 years, 70% of the world population will live in these cities. But cities are not necessarily communities. And therefore, there lies another very, very big challenge. And this is an area where we have some experience by bringing together people. Sometimes people say, uh, sometimes other comments say, well, people are not interested. People are very much interested. We, as a Bertelsmann Foundation, we gave the city of Recife in Brazil the Reinhard Mohn Prize for the best organized internal democracy and, and participation of citizens. Maybe there are some lessons there, and I want to get back to that in a minute. But I want to bring um, Harry Van uh, Dorenmillen into this discussion from IBM. And IBM is involved in a number of uh, programs, uh, particularly your supporting uh, cities program around the world. Why are you involved in working as much as you are with cities uh, as opposed to central government? Yeah. I mean, let's make these things simple. I mean, this convention talks about the world, the globe, the macro level. And we have huge discussions going on there. But we as a company feel so motivated that, assume for a minute at the macro level, it take, will take time. Then on the micro level, you can progress. And we learned that municipalities, cities, mayors are the areas where movement can be made. So let's help these people. One example, Stockholm, eight years ago, eight years ago, not yesterday, eight years ago, the mayor of the city took leadership, rule number one. He said, I have an issue. I want my transportation to be fixed in my city. 30, he put some people around the table, not 60, not 100, just 15 parties. That's it. And I said, go and work and use me if you block to any blocking factors. Come to me. And guess what? Two years later, the results were there. Carbon emission down, traffic down, 
it can be so simple. So we are motivated that those entities who have the guts and the leadership to do something and don't talk about mandate and governments and money. There is no money. Look at Europe. All the countries have a deficit. There is no money. And by the way, there's no time because we have issues in this world to fix. So we are so motivated that these entities, they move on and we are supporting that leadership. That is why we are so motivated on that one. Now, there's no money. I suspect in some cases there's a lot of tension between the cities and central governments about uh, uh, these uh, international policies and uh, international activism. How about in Lisbon? Uh, what have you been seeing there, Greca? Um, you know, I was thinking about that. Um, one of the problems I think we have at this point, it's a global problem. You have the problem of legitimacy. Uh, you have a problem of suspicions on politicians and on political institutions. And that's global. That's not a problem of Portugal, of Lisbon, of France, whatever. It's, it's global. And it's, it's quite difficult to uh, over, overcome that problem. And, and really, I think it's one of the major risks we face in democracy um, next years to come. If we are able to, at the city level, to engage people to participate and to have a different approach to what means to run the public affairs, that will make a difference. If we have instruments like you have in other cities, like, for instance, the participatory budgeting, in which you give the, the people the power to decide what they are going to do with public money, money that is from everybody, that make a difference. And that is quite difficult to do at the national level. That's a small example. I see every day thousands of people wanting to say, I would like to build that with my money, and I can do that. And that's hugely important to build trust between citizens and their institutions, parties, and democracy at the end of the day. Now, we have an audience where everyone lives in, uh, live in, uh, lives in a city, big or small, and I'm curious to get some reaction to what some of your cities are doing as it relates to international outreach. And maybe there might be lessons there for the rest of us. So uh, I think we'll have uh, the first uh, example uh, here. If you can get a microphone. Um, Ana Maria Salazar. I work for uh, Mexican media and uh, I'm a security analyst. I, th there's, Mexico City has probably been one of the cities where they've had a lot of um, international outreach, in part because of the political activities of a very, uh, of, a, of a mayor who was looking to have that type of presence uh, outside of, of Mexico. But also it's considered to be one of the most liberal capitals in, 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 in the world, there, or particularly in Latin America, where you have uh, women are allowed to have legal abortions, gay marriages. I mean, so there was, and, and which kind of brings me to one of my comments in terms of having this discussion, which I don't think what's been said is that I think one of the major issues in terms of trying to understand why cities aren't more global has to do with the internal politics. National, you will have your Secretary of Foreign Relations ex always get very anxious and upset when you have mayors exercising their own right to have their own foreign affairs relations with other, with other, with cities in other parts of the world. I mean, what uh, you, I think that's the biggest threat or the biggest difficulty to face is that the State Department in the United States gets very nervous. In Mexico City, you have foreign relations. Any foreign relations is always going to be very nervous when you have important politicians uh, from big cities uh, having contact with other important politicians in other big cities around the world. So in, in that sense, I kind of put that on the table because we can talk about m mayors being your global ambassadors, but at the end of the day, the first, you know, those who are going to come down and slap down this idea is going to be the national governments who don't like these type of activities. That's a good point. Roberto, let's, let's go to you in terms of the tensions that you're seeing with the national government when you try to execute some of the advice that you're giving the mayor. Uh, let, me, let me first say that uh, if we put it in the, in the long-term long perspective, the city and the nation, yes, there have been, uh, during the 17th century, there have been rivals, political rivals. They, they saw each other as, as rivals. Probably in the 19th century, you see how cities become creatures of the nation states. 
But I believe that in the 21st government, there is a growing sentiment, uh, even from national uh, governments, that they have to work with the cities and they have to coordinate uh, policies. Let me, let me put this uh, as an example. If a city decides to boycott, for example, uh, several goods uh, that may be produced with uh, slave labor or child labor in uh, the developing world, and the city, as a local authority, does that, it might be in a violation of uh, some compromise that has been done by the nation states with the WTO. Uh, that at the global level. Uh, at the local level, at the national levels, the, 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 the example of the bearing arms, cities that have been trying to, to uh, law or to, to work on the, the, the issue of, uh, of the bearing arms, uh, sometimes always, uh, also clashes with the interest or with the legal frameworks of the nations. But I believe that in a, uh, I repeat actually that in the, in the information-based uh, capitalism, uh, you, you see that the, uh, that the relation between the city and the nation-state may be eroded because of the interdependence between the cities, but the territoriality, I mean, the, 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 the cities are territorial in a different way than states. And I believe that there's the key for cooperation between cities and nations, because cities, their interdependence is tied to their relation with uh, 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 cities that are far away, but it's based on communications, it's based in culture, it's based in, in services, in business, in finance. So uh, uh, I think that at the end of the day, the, the national governments that see where the 21st century economy is going, uh, they, would, they will do their best to work with the cities, and cities themselves, they, they don't have to pose themselves as, 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 the, as replacing the states in the decision-making at global level, but working with the states, with, but having a higher voice. Okay. Thanks, nobody. We have a, a question or a comment back here. I can do it without the mic, but if we've got the mic, we'll use the mic. <laughs> Tom Burke from uh, Rio Tinto. Um, uh, the, the tension between the city and the nation is, it seems to me, a really central issue on this debate. But what I'm hearing so far is, in a sense, cities almost saying, uh, please leave us alone and we'll get on with all this wonderful experimentation and, and great innovation and drive things forward. Actually, uh, my perception is the cities are in real danger of nation states not changing policy in a way that will maintain the food, energy, water, and climate security without which cities can't survive. And so rather in a sense than, than uh, the, the cities sort of want to get the nation state off their backs, they need to be asking much more of the nations so that they will maintain that capacity to absorb what is it, a million people a week who are moving into cities around the world. And by the way, the people that are really going to shape the future of cities aren't moving from London to Lisbon or uh, to Bangalore. They're the people who are moving in from the countryside into Jakarta, into uh, uh, Dakar, into all those cities that are enormously vulnerable to any failure of nation states to maintain food, energy, water, and climate security. We have a related point that's being made by uh, someone else right here. Um, uh, yeah, my Right. Um, I'm from South Africa. I'm, I'm somewhat I'm ambivalent about this because, um, as the previous question or previous statement made, uh, said it, it kind of undermines uh, the nation states and sovereignty. And um, I suppose those are some of the issues that we that we join on. And I think specifically in the case of maybe South Africa and maybe I don't know in the case of Buenos Aires and Argentina, um, is the opposition uh, is the current opposition uh, or is uh, the mayor that is currently in power in Buenos Aires in opposition to uh, the ruling party, as is the case in Cape Town, for example, in South Africa with, with regard to uh, the, the, national, the national government. Because then, then it becomes a very political issue and they're using the cities and the, 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 the link to the nation state as, uh, to, uh, in, in a more jeopardizing fashion. Let's get two quick reactions to that. Let's start with Grasser. Well, um yeah, sometimes uh, I would like this, the nation to give me, to just let me be and uh, make my things at the city level. Y you are right, but I need the state, I need the instruments uh, that at least regulate and at least make me as a city responsible, able to do some things. 
okay? But the thing is, the state needs me as much as I need the state. Because nowadays, um, there is no chance, no chance that at the national level, you'll be able to implement uh, instruments to, for instance, uh, go and have solutions to employment rates, for instance. You need city level. You need city level to be, if you want, the focal antennas that will be able to give it to the persons that need it. And that's complementary, that uh, is usually necessary in the future. If we all come to the conclusion that we need each other, and that sometimes I will be more able to do it, and sometimes the state needs to uh, put forward some instruments and some regulations, we'll live happily and citizens will have what they need. I think, Harry, you wanted to get in on this? Yeah, I, I think you know, this is a situation, by the way, the tension that we feel on the ground as well. So I have a few observations on that one. First of all, you know, uh, a lot of the times when I'm helping a mayor of Amsterdam and they, we want to do something, then people come with a list of things that are in the way. My experience, I call it irritators. Some of these things are valid. Some of these things are bullshit, excusez le mot. They, they are. But uh, give us an example of one only, of those BS things that you talked about. I mean, as an example, in, in Amsterdam, you know, we have difficulties in getting people from abroad, Holland, in, in working in Amsterdam. So the mayor took action for that. He has a fast track. It's done. But nobody knows it, and people keep, mo keep moaning about it. So the point I want to make, from those many things, why it cannot be done, a part is real, the rest isn't real. So bring that to the clarity. The second thing I want to say is what I call lower the center of gravity. We come for the statement that the state is dictating everything and the people follow, black and white set. I believe social media, youngsters in the world, you know, we have a knowledgeable population, consumers, patients, students, whatever. So let's use that, you know. So start not leading that bond, but start supporting, enabling it. That is the change. And change is hard. I mean, that's the whole. So we need tension. A question or a comment? Very much. Uh, this is very exciting. I have a little bias towards cities. Uh, that's why being a diplomat, a Ghanaian diplomat, uh, having been a mayor of a small town in northern Ghana, uh, I think that uh, I'm also motivated by the fact that the UN Charter says we the peoples and uh, cities have a strategic role to play in people-to-people -people diplomacy. Tensions there will be, but these are healthy tensions and we just have to manage them. In Ghana, we have twinning of city or towns between Ghana and Burkina Faso, our neighbor, and among other countries. We have twinning with uh, European countries, I mean, cities like Germany uh, and the US. The other day at the UN, I walked into a UN meeting uh, it was on decentralization relating to the Rio Plus 20. And there was a mayor of the city of Cape Coast attending the meeting. The mission had no prior knowledge. Uh, normal tension. You say, ah, but how come we didn't know about this? But this was healthy. I mean, they are moving faster than we are, and we have to just catch up with them and flow I mean, with it if we are serious about people-to-people -people, I mean, diplomacy. Is that a one-off at the UN? Or if, <laughs> if more and more uh, mayors uh, end up showing up into the halls and in the yes, General yes. Assembly representing their countries, yes. uh, would you be here smiling and saying it's a great thing? Yeah, uh, when they come, they are not actually representing their countries. They are engaged in um, specific programs which are aimed at doing what was said by the panelists. Uh, actions relating to the environment, investment, and things like that. And as diplomats, this is what we should be supporting and facilitating. And if they move faster than us, we catch up and move with them. Terrific. As I walk to um, another questioner down here, I wanted to give uh, Norberto an opportunity to uh, answer that question uh, as well as Art. Uh, let, let me first say that uh, tensions between urban and national identities or interests, it's a fact that, that the city's cooperation should deal with and overcome. We could be discussing forever whether what to do with those tensions, but uh, I think that at the end of the day, uh, we're not talking about replacing the traditional uh, institutions of global governance by those 
uh, in which only cities participate, but the uh, existence of both at the same time, and at, uh, always, of course, rising and giving more voice to cities within those uh, traditional organizations. And uh, regarding the, uh, your question, Lyle, um, today, yes, that's, that's the case uh, of Buenos Aires, but it has been the case of Buenos Aires for the last 30 years. So it's not a, 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 a matter of, uh, of the current mayor, but a traditional trend that happens in, in, in the Argentine politics. Art, would you like a piece of that question really quickly? Very briefly. Um, the cultural issue as addressed is extremely important. And if you want to build a global, global world or a European world, but let, let's call it global or transatlantic, then it's extremely important that citizens around the world understand each other, know each other. There, the nations can never play the role that cities can play in bringing together people. Nations only have opportunities like in Olympic Games or so, but why, why don't we have this kind of Olympic meetings between cities among each other? Because they bring the real citizens to each other. Uh, question, come on, if you can stand, please. International Crisis Group. Um, first, uh, 20 years ago, we used to hear a lot about mega cities, and I'm wondering, especially getting back to the first question, whether there's a sort of a special set of problems that the, that the and, a, and a certain kind of clout that the mega cities over 10 million or whatever the threshold is could get together on in terms of pressuring others or and working together to solve problems. Second, um, all of the countries that I know well are are going through some sort of regionalization as well. So you have all of these smaller cities with very high growth rates in Morocco, other places. And I'm wondering whether for smaller regional cities, if there's some, a separate track than maybe the mega cities track where you can, they can take, care of, uh, uh, take advantage of comparative advantage, uh, um, diasporic relationships sisters, you know, through sister cities, if there's a, another way for regional cities. And then the last question is, uh, we heard on the first day and the second day very interesting discussions about youth, youth not being heard, youth with ideas, cities teeming with youth. And I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether if cities are so much more efficacious, if there's a way, you know, cities can institutionalize youth involvement in solving problem both in cities and between cities as these relationships are built. You know, that, that's a good question about cities and youth. For uh, many of you who were here this morning, to the uh, uh, panel we had on, on youth, uh, many people would say that uh, there's not enough uh, that is, uh, that's being done and being said about that issue. And we'll come back to that after uh, the question that we will have next. Yeah. Uh, my name is Emil Mayberg, um, and I'm also from South Africa. Um, I don't have so much a question as a comment that I would like to make about Johannesburg. My friend from uh, South Africa commented about Cape Town. But in Johannesburg, uh, for the first time in the history of South Africa, we've now got what comes close to uh, a metro system. And it's not really underground, although part of it is, is underground. But for anybody who knows the history of South Africa, South Africa is the country of the car. Until recently, if you lived in Johannesburg and you didn't have a car, you simply went nowhere unless you used the very unreliable and very unsafe uh, taxis that uh, operated there. What Johannesburg has done was, first of all, to build the Gau train, which has put high-profile businessmen, taken them off, uh, out of their cars, onto the Gau train, uh, where they can travel between Johannesburg and Pretoria in 40 minutes, which in, in peak time, which in the past would take two hours. Uh, we've now got a connection between the airport and, uh, and downtown Johannesburg, which takes you 15 minutes in the past. Uh, if you had an early morning flight arriving in Johannesburg, you would look at around an hour, hour and a half just to get to your meeting. Uh, and in addition, in downtown Johannesburg, uh, which was a major uh, undertaking, it involved finance from British banks, Brazilian banks. Uh, they've uh, put the Raya Vaya, which means let's go, a bus project, which uh, takes people from the townships into the center of Johannesburg. And this is an example, I think, of how a city has transformed the lives of its inhabitants rather than uh, the, the country, the, the nation. Um, and just as an aside, while they were building the Gau train, running from Johannesburg to Pretoria, stopping at several stations, it was for a time the biggest construction project in the world. You know, I'm going to turn to Grasa and I'll also turn to Harry next with those questions. But if you would please stand up, I want to ask you a question about Johannesburg. Many of us have been there 
many times, and it's a fairly large and important city. What, how is uh, Johannesburg uh, playing, or what is it doing in terms of becoming a major international player? Well, Johannesburg being the capital, the financial capital of uh, Johannesburg, of South Africa, uh, makes it in many respects also the financial capital of Africa. Many uh, international corporations go to Johannesburg not because they want to have a presence in South Africa, obviously if that's uh, their aim, then they will go to Johannesburg, but because they want to get a foothold in Africa. Um, several Brazilian companies, I act mostly for Brazilian companies in South Africa, have come to set up shop in Johannesburg because they want to do procurement for their African operations. Uh, and uh, Johannesburg itself markets itself as a world-class African city. So that, you, know, you can come to Johannesburg uh, for your business in Africa. You've got a world-class financial system, uh, a very li reliable legal system, uh, and as far as the rule of law, which we talked about earlier, is concerned, South Africa is one of the safest places to go and set up an investment. So in that respect, Johannesburg is really a, a great city, and it's marketing itself as a great city for the whole of Africa. Are you with the tourism department? <laughs> Let's just check. Thank you. I just wanted to go to um, Grasser on that question and then um, Harry to uh, uh, address that, those two is, those issues. On what question? Sorry? Uh, wanted to ask the, go to the, the question from uh, this gentleman. From regions and... Um, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a difficult approach because on one hand, the reg regional level, it's, um, it's an important level in terms of the organization of public powers, okay, of the states. Portugal is a small country, so our cities are also small cities, medium cities, okay? So when I think about the, the way that the state should be organized, I think about regions should be important and in terms of more efficient, well, the state organization, okay? But when I think about the proximity with people, when I think about all the things that we are speaking here, about youth problems that it was raised here, the regions won't be able to get there. So we have to be clever, we have to be smart, because we cannot lose that connection that at the city level you can be able to connect with people. F just give you an example. At this point in Lisbon, uh, in, well, in Portugal in general, but particularly in Lisbon, I think we have the most qualified generation ever in the, our recent history. Okay? We've never had so many people coming out of universities, and we, we never had such a high qualified um, human power. At the national level, the answer is being immigrate, okay? Uh, which is of, of, obviously I'm exaggerating, but at the local level, I see several cities, not only Lisbon, but several cities trying to implement programs that act locally to find new startups, to find new incubators, to find new local uh, programs that will not um, promote immigration. And why? Because in the medium long term, if we let this generation get out of Portugal, they won't return. And they are the active generation. They will have kids elsewhere. Okay, so it will aggravate our problem. So it's conflict. I just want to bring um, Harry in here on yeah. this. It's two points. First of all, I mean, uh, we should avoid that all these mayors now s starting to say, hey, I'm in Portland, I need to s create a smarter city. Because then we are getting be making the reverse angle. My view is on this one, you know, mega city, small, it should be an entity that has a value proposition that is where people are better off than before. You know, that de decides more or less the size. Secondly, I mean, in, in our country, Holland, you know, to be honest, there are three big areas of growth and growth is future. So don't go for 65 areas. It's a waste of time and money. Find a way that people can contribute. Yeah, that's the key thing. Here in this country, Rabat, you know, in this city, Rabat, the mayor is very uh, focused on, on a smarter city. But he knows 
that he can provide the, 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 the skills and the IT and the green environment heavy, but he knows that he needs Casablanca as the industry area. So they are so smart, these two mayors, to come together. That's the way. So there, there's no spin to it. Don't make it magic. Stay simple. And on youth, to be honest, the question is quite simple. How often do you all connect to younger people? That's the question. So we can talk here, we, we connect with young people, we connect with young people. If you don't do it, you don't do it. And each quarter I'm with the university and, and with our parties from the young professionals over there. And to be honest, they learn a little bit from us, but we learn much, much more from them. So the question to yourself tonight after the drink, have, are you doing it or are we talking about it? Thanks, Harry. I want to ask, uh, bring in a questioner here, but before I do that, I also want to mention that uh, I'd like to get a comment from, we've had the panelists talk about Europe, but someone from Europe to talk about uh, some of these issues. There are some, several, as you know, major cities in Europe. Uh, I'd like to get uh, a view from one of those. In addition to that, someone from the Caribbean. I'd like to um, hear what the thinking is coming from that region about these very important issues. Could you please stand? Hi, I'm Kamadev Chatterjee from the European Young Innovators Forum. And I was just going to ask a few questions, which Harry answered anyway. So, so, but I'll still try and formulate them. The first one is, I, you know, great to have a lot of mayors walking into the United Nations and love to see how many from Argentina would support uh, the ones from Uruguay or from Paraguay. But on a more basic level, in the next three to four years, is there a view, and the question here, is there a view that the first step to all of this is to be smarter in the way you deal with your people and your challenges? So smart city as a concept, okay, it's a very cool concept right now and everybody wants to be on that, but is the first step to cities moving away from nation states the fact that they become smarter in the way that they deal with their challenges and what, what you feel as being, in, I was in Lisbon uh, three weeks ago, I found it a fantastic city, but are you moving to a smarter city? I, is that something that you see in the same thing in Argentina? The second point is we talked about nation states and cities, but this, this assumes that cities are always linked to nation states. What if, as in some parts of Europe, cities are not linked to nation states but to regions? For example, the Rhine region, there are four or five big cities there, Frankfurt, Aachen, Strasbourg, Ghent. These cities, if you go to them, they, they have the Rhine culture. It's not the French, German, or, or, or Belgian, if, if you can call Belgian uh, culture. So what about that? You know, is, it, is it smarter to have a network of smart cities rather than a network of cities within the nation? And the final question, of course, on youth. And uh, I like your point about saying, okay, can we, you know, should we institutionalize uh, the efforts of youth? But I would actually say the other way around from the young innovators' perspective. It's a reverse. We don't want to be institutionalized. Please spare us. <laughs> you know, what we'd like to do is the reverse, to work in partnership with you, with the cities, to provide us some facilities and some access. And then we can work with our peers who are in cities across the region and provide solutions. So we can do a lot of the stuff that you want to do or, can, or aim to do, but are, you are constrained by legal frameworks. A city has a charter from a nation state, but the citizens in the cities and the young people, we are only constrained by imagination. So can that be an objective? It's a good point. Uh, what did they ask? Is, is there anyone here from Barcelona? Oh, I'd like to uh, bring you into the discussion uh, in a few minutes. But before I do that, there is a question over here. Hi, uh, Adam Freed from New York City, and up until last month I actually worked at City Hall uh, on a lot of these issues. One quick comment on the megacities and the role that they're playing. Uh, the top 50 cities in the world actually represent 25% of global GDP, and recognizing that they're a major force, they're coming together in networks. One network that's actually chaired by Mayor Bloomberg and Buenos Aires is a member uh, is the C40 network, 59 global cities taking action on climate change, and they represent 8% of global population, 12% of GHG emissions, and 21% uh, of GDP, so taking action be pretty massive, and, and I, I disagree with the idea of having a, a United Nations of cities. I, I think the network idea and, and mayors being the world's pragmatists, they're coming together to advocate for more resources, more funding for the regulatory flexibility they need, um, and to share best practices, because they're really leading the way on climate action, on poverty reduction, on public health, and, and that is actually my question of how do we leverage the positive examples and the lessons to be learned, positive or negative, from current and, and uh, cities and mega cities, and apply those to those emerging cities, as we do have now. In 1950, there was only one city with over 10 million. Now there are over 10 in China alone. How do we make sure we're not locking in for generations a lot of the mistakes that happen with poor planning today um, by taking the past lessons from cities? 
Norberto or Art, do you want to address any of those questions? Yes, yes, yes. I think, uh, I think the, what the last gentleman said from New York and from this network of city, I totally agree that a network where you can learn from each other is really very appropriate. Um, I have worked in OECD, which is, a, which is a union of nations, and there are nations try to learn from each other, but inside the OECD there was also developed this network of cities. And I think particularly there you have to learn from each other, because if you learn only from your own mistakes, you go too slowly. And there are, there are actually chances to learn from each other. Copenhagen invested in a bicycle system, which uh, reduced air pollution, which increased the mobility, and which is fun for each other, for, for the citizens, and increased even the health of the people. So uh, we, had the, we had the example of, uh, of, of, of Cape Town, uh, uh, or Johannesburg, where we, we see that in some uh, cities, well, during my tenure as a minister, we totally delegated all the welfare to the cities. And guess what? The number of, um, of entitlements for unemployment benefits was reduced by 25%. Why? Because if, if they have the financial responsibility, they take action to invest in integration and in social inclusion. This is a disconnect that all the, all the options for actions are not, re, are not connected to the financial systems of investment. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of lessons that you can learn from each other. Final question. Is it then, uh, should there then be uh, a, a kind of uh, regional approach, like the gentleman said, uh, or is it just each city for, for each? First of all, we have to understand there is a distinction between what is national and local as such, and then we have the special role of the cities. And I think we are talking here tonight more or less about the second. And then we have uh, in this Rhine area and in the Randstad area and in some other areas in the world, you have basically the idea of a connection of former industrial cities forming a kind of a mega city which is comparable to others. So there should be connections, and there the governance issues is, of course, even more complicated, but there should be that connection. Terrific. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, you see, Dutch people always get excited eh, when it's getting uh, <laughs> further on, but I like, s I like your comment about New York so much, because I'm sometimes wondering that New York has done a great job because they, they fixed more or less their crime and safety environment, you know? They've done a great job for a larger city. So apparently, they found an infrastructure solution, they found applications, they equipped policemen with PDAs, they had the whole thing integrated going, they have control systems. Then you wonder, why is it possible that this solution, you know, cannot be applied in Madrid or Paris? So in the past, we did not have these So the net is that we, people who are traveling, we see all these solutions there. So, I mean, that is what we need to bring together. So, and to em emerging or nascent countries, we can help there with energy and water solutions that we have all over the world. So this is really intriguing things. And sometimes I wonder, why not? Why not? Is it only the political unwill, or hopefully people don't know? A and if these mayors see it, then we can do something about it. But this is a real action we can take. You know, a, a quick time check. We have about 15 minutes left. I know that a lot of you want to get into this discussion, and I know the panelists have more to say. I think it would help if we all keep uh, our comments from the audience and questions brief, and the panelists will do the same. So, Norberto, I, I think you have uh, uh, to yeah, make a few quick comments to, on that. Point. I wanted to, to react to uh, two comments that I, uh, I heard. Um, uh, the first one give you some, some math regarding the, the, the city of Buenos Aires. It said we have 2.8 million people living, uh, but every day from Monday to Friday, about the same amount, actually 2.5 people is coming to work to, of course, uh, they use the, 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 the interurban transport system, uh, they leave their trash there, so our challenge there in, in terms of your question with mega cities, uh, and also in terms of the participation and city networks, is to find the, the common ground uh, in order to share those best practice, but uh, uh, we're not maybe looking at one of the comments where that the challenge is uh, the people from the country going to cities, but you see in Latin America, which is the most urbanized region of the world, and it's, it also has the burden of being the most unequal region of the world, uh, you don't see uh, the, the, the main trend. There's the last report from UN Habit uh, that says that the, the main trend is people 
going from city to city, not from the country to the cities. So that's also some specific challenge. No, no, Berger, I know you said you had two points. We'll come back to the other one in a few minutes. If, we can, if you can stand, please, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Tulentino from uh, Cape Verde, a small developing archipelago. Uh, let me share three brief can points. You make, can you share two? Sorry? Can you share two? <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I agree with you. We need tension to have uh, development evolution, but let's try to avoid chaos. And um, with this, I, I, would, um, I would think that we need, in order to have uh, governments, city government, uh, effective city government, they have to keep small in terms of organization. I mean, going to the citizen instead of trying to go to a, a world organization of cities, creating a big bureaucracy. Uh, and, and thinking about the citizen, I, I, I think about, for instance, the experience of Portugal, Lisbon, concretely, and from Brazil, where they are trying to involve citizens in, in, in local programs and, and improving the democracy, real democracy. So uh, I would be against this world stuff in there. And in the small developing countries, one thing that I, I, I consider is a must, is a coordination between the city government and the national government in order to have good public policies involving everyone. Thank you. Those are excellent points, and I'll be coming to uh, Grasa to answer them in a minute, but uh, there's another question or comment here. Uh, Roman Marcos from uh, Nova Law School in Lisbon and from the uh, Joint Higher Staff and Command College Ministry of Defense uh, in Portugal. I want to, um, the mantra for the last 20 years has been think globally, act locally, and it seems to me that the panel is modulating this into something else. Think globally, act urbanly seems to be the uh, new mantra. Now, this does create some, to my mind, some uh, series of political problems, some micro ones and some macro ones. Um, let me, I don't know with which to begin. Um, I thought we were going to talk about city-states like Singapore or like uh, Hong Kong virtually. Uh, we're not. We're talking about uh, the demographic flux of people into cities uh, that gives us more, about 40-something percent of people in the world only who do not live in cities. And what you're actually proposing when you're talking about the United Cities uh, of the world is a club of participatory democracy, 50-plus uh, percent of the people of the world. And my two questions uh, are political and relate to this. Does this not disempower the 40% of the people who do not live in cities? This is the micro problem. By centering all of political decision-making, political parties, power in urban areas on the one hand. And on the other hand, what are the rules of this club? Is this not kind of a neo-medieval guild of cities rather than the United Cities that you're proposing here? Is it not a corporatist regime? And that you're asking nationally, those two things preoccupy me. I see Gotham City Batman on the horizon. <laughs> so, Grasser, a club of participatory democracies. What do you think? Second, um, yeah. I don't know if uh, I don't know if Gotham City is is, is coming. I hope not. But. Um, when, when at least I speak about cities, I don't think about city-states. I think about cities in a local level, in a more, uh, not micro, but small, small level. Um, and when I, when I was uh, philosoph when I was speaking about the United Nations, so it's not the question of 
institutionalize something. It's, it's not that. It's um, what was in the basis of founding the United Nations at that point. What led states to found the United Nations? And at this point, what we are discussing is, do cities need to assume a different role that did in the previous 50 years? And if it's such, maybe we should think about ways of connecting cities that nowadays are connected. I mean, Lisbon has, of course, several bilateral relations with several cities, with uh, cities from Cape Verde to cities in Brazil, of course. And that's something that's rule um, every day, okay? What I was uh, discussing as a provocative issue as we were preparing this, this debate was, do we, do we have to think in the future on a different way of cities to connect with themselves and try to solve the same problems because the city of Lisbon has the same problems as the city-states. We have the, the problem of young people, we have the problem of elderly people, and that, those problems are not local, they are global. And that's something to think about it. Archie wanted to yeah, get in I, here. I was, thinking of the, I was thinking of what we had in Europe. Is my mic, mic working? Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking about what we had in Europe, the Hansa uh, a group, which was uh, a reaction of the innovation in transportation, like like uh, sea shipping, etc. And then this group of cities in uh, northwestern Europe was a very powerful league, but it was not institutionalized in terms of governance. It was just a group of cities who worked together. To, uh, to represent the, the, the interest and to have some common rules about how you could pay and how, what was recognized and, and you know, measuring uh, goods, etc. So this is, an, this is for me more an example than an institution of a world club. So it is not anti-government. I think we need governments because we also need the rural area for agriculture, for food. How could a city ever, ever control food security? So there are there are national issues and there are, there are, there are city issues. By the way, the, the national level of government is in itself something that doesn't exist since, man, since, since the history of mankind. It was more or less something that was evolved uh, over the last 200 years. So we can ask ourselves the question, in the 21st century, is the nation state the most appropriate way of democracy? And in the Bertelsmann Stifting, we say, well, we need the nation state, but we really definitely have to make a move also because for identity reasons and for connecting to people in democracy to the local level, cities included. Thanks, Art. Why don't we move over here? I, I believe this is part of our Caribbean delegation and it gives us a chance to uh, talk about how things are in large cities in small countries. Well, I'm from the Eastern Caribbean and this is one problem we don't you? have. Yeah. We don't have the could, issue. Could you please identify yourself? Yes, Jennifer Nero from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. And we don't have the problems that you have in the big cities. However, we feel like we have a role to play. Because while you are trying to sort out the congestion, please come on down to the islands where we are fully connected um, with, the, uh, with the technology. And we have a very stress-free zone where you can work out your complicated problems with congestion on the, night, on the lighter side. But it is also good for our, for our economies because we are, we are tourism based and we do have some therapeutic, very tranquil environment to offer you. Thank you very much. Now on a serious note, my colleague. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Yes, it is the uh, Caribbean contingent here. Um, just very quickly, my name is Len Ishmael, also from the Eastern Caribbean. We share sister institutions. I'm with the OECS Secretariat. Just very quickly to say, years and years ago in another life, I was an urban planner for New York City. I'm back in the Caribbean, 600,000 people and not even a neighborhood in a borough in New York City. The scale is completely different. We're trying to find some commonalities in the conversation here about cities. Um, what is clear, however, is that the scale is very different 
but some of the issues really, really are the same, so that we do have our own rush hour problems, which might be over in all of about 40 minutes, but nonetheless, they drive us crazy. So issues of congestion, urban infrastructure, uh, but much less by way of resources, which is really um, a very limiting factor for us. So things that we build have to be there and stay forever. Unless, of course, there's a hurricane that knocks them off or something like that. But really and truly, uh, this has been a really very good uh, discussion. Uh, for us, however, and for our colleagues over in the Cape Verde Islands, with whom there's now a strong transatlantic uh, convergence of interest, is the fact that um, urban planning takes on a much larger role in the management of all sorts of resources. And I've been hearing about cities, but not really the role of urban planners and urban planning. In the case of the islands, which are small as this, of course, we plan not just for the cities, but we plan for the entire countries because that's how small we are. But we do have an urban, uh, a rural to urban uh, problem that we have to deal with. And increasingly, poverty is becoming much more of an urban face. Thanks. Uh, we'll go to Harry to answer. Harry, I, I think I heard an invitation for IBM to come to the Caribbean, no? Well, I mean, first of all, we need an additional night owl to give you some information about Singapore, Hong Kong, and we are so happy to do that, but we are protecting you, to be honest. And secondly, we need to fly the, look for the flying schedules, you know? I mean, that's all night owl work for tonight, but also, like you said, on a serious note, I mean, you know, and we're coming to the end, maybe a little bit philosophically, if you will, but we are exhausting this planet. We are exhausting this planet. Trust it or not. Water, energy, minerals, etc. So we need solutions. Current states, we are not fast enough. And I do see this element from cities, environments where people are, who know each other, who get things in going. That is what I see as a right, good model. And of course, there are things in the way, and of course, there are difficulties. But that is why I'm oh, so excited about this one. We have we have a code to crack on this planet, you know, really. And that's why I'm so motivated on these entities. And there are great examples of cities, environments, municipalities, whatever you like to call it, who are moving. You know, I, I wanted to talk to someone from Barcelona, and I asked, um, and this uh, gentleman has George, uh, George has. Uh, has said he's from there, but we've all been reading about what's happening in Catalonia, and uh, it may or may not uh, be happening soon in, where Barcelona might actually be in the thick of what we're talking about. So what's the view from Barcelona and Catalonia? Well, I, I don't live in Barcelona. I live north of Barcelona, but certainly Barcelona has established its own uh, trademark. Uh, it has a brand. That brand is worth a lot uh, and attracts a lot of visitors, a lot of investment, a lot of uh, biomedical research. And so I think I, I listened to this debate about cities and, and, and nations. Uh, to me, they're, they're very complementary. And they have different responsibilities. And smart states have basically said, you deliver urban services and the social services that, that should be delivered in urban areas, and uh, we'll help you, and you help us by relieving the burden that the center uh, has. And I think, like the panelists have been saying, that cities really are on the front lines. They can't argue about solutions too long. They've got to find solutions because their citizens required of them, and if not, they're out very soon. And I think they see opportunities much quicker because they're closer to the citizenry and can mobilize the citizenry, citizenry to cooperate to find solutions. And I think this provides a dynamism within cities, both large and small. I'm in the development business and um, uh, working with USAID in the past. And we always went to talk to the mayors when we went into the rural areas because the municipalities and secondary cities are very much central to the development process. And the development process doesn't take place in a rural area or in an urban area. It takes place in a corridor that links rural urban areas and that, that's what really makes development. And I would say one more point that cities like Barcelona are linking with cities like Montpellier or Perpignan and they're building corridors of real development and really uh, responding to their citizens' um, uh, needs. 
And in terms of Barcelona and Catalonia, we can talk a lot about that. You've seen the demonstrations. But of course, Barcelona is the capital of Catalonia. And that creates certain tensions and certain competition with Madrid, which is the capital of Spain. And uh, that gives Barcelona a very different role to play as uh, Spain uh, looks to decide how centralized versus how autonomous, decentralized around autonomous regions it wants to be. And Catalonia is the one that's stepping up to the plate to challenge a centralizing, what they perceive to be a centralizing trend in Spanish public administration. Thank you, George. Good comment. As I pass the uh, microphone to Ms. Salazar, I wanted to give you a quick time check to say that uh, we have uh, just been given an extra four minutes, so we'll be okay. wrapping up. Okay. Uh, so. I just want to add on a little bit more of this complexity to this tension between nation, state, and cities, because we haven't spoken about many countries are divided between state or departments. So you actually even have a, an intervening uh, uh, political uh, force that needs to be dealt with. And I, and I do think you need to talk about, because at the end of the day, if a city is going out and trying to have relations with other countries, or, or other cities outside of their country, it might have to do either one, because they perceive that the solutions to their problems cannot be found within their country because of the lack of success of their, of their government, or two, they're looking for political uh, strength outside the country. And both of that creates, creates t in inherent tensions in trying to define what the roles of the cities are. At the end of the day, and this is, I guess, what my question is, I, there is no stopping in terms of strengthening local governments in having relations in outside of their nations if they're looking for internal change. Is that where, if you cannot find change within your country, you forcefully have to go out of, of, of your boundaries? Noberta, we'll, if you can answer that in about 10 seconds, and while I take, there are three questions over here that I'd like to take to um, help round out uh, our program and then uh, we'll give each panelist about uh, 20 or so seconds to wrap up. 20 seconds, I said, okay. But, but first, uh, no better, if you wanted to respond to... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think you... Hello? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I would say first, let me please clarify that uh, we're not proposing a, a United Nations of, of cities because sometimes the press may, may, may titulate later this, uh, uh, an official from the city government of Buenos Aires proposed that. Uh, that what, what we're saying, uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, 21st century challenges, global challenges, need an approach of global governance that it's multi-level and multi-stakeholder. They, they not necessarily exclude one each other, one, one and the, with the other. And let me also say that local governments, as, as he was pointing out, uh, are closer to citizens. So we tend to see democracy as a, 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 a frozen I concept, as a frozen institution. Uh, but democracy as a concept evolved during the last centuries. So Cities can also be laboratories for the, experimentation, for the experimentation of new type of democracy and the new type of, of citizenship. So I, I wanted to, to, to stress that. But. Uh, thank you. That's a good clarification. Please. I'll, I'll be very quick. My name is Mathieu Lefebvre. I'm the director of uh, an organization called the New Cities Foundation. I wanted to slightly instill a greater sense of urgency into this debate because it's not like you know, we're talking about just another issue on the global agenda. This is perhaps, I would argue, the most pressing issues. I mean, we need to find solutions to the problems of the exploding urban population. Let me just give you two very quick figures. One, China is rapidly approaching its billion urban population. That's a staggering figure. Number two, a country like Nigeria is rapidly approaching 200 million urban dwellers. So that really changes everything. So I think we need to find the best solutions. If I had one piece of advice for national governments is decentralize and do it as fast as you can on key issues that are on your plate that are burden burdening and causing blockages in national governments like infrastructure financing, health care, education, transportation. Push that out to the cities, you'll get more done. Terrific, thank you. 
Hi, I'm Caroline Alexis Thomas. Everybody knows me by now from <laughs> Trinidad. Okay, um, I'm part of a twin island state. It's Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Tobago, um, the, the city is Scarborough, but there's no mayor. Right? There's no mayor there. Um, I'm joining my colleague from the OECS. We are very, the Caribbean, small island states, no mayor, just cities. So, in this uh, Atlantic dialogue, what? What did the number you just said? 200 million people? Uh uh. 50,000 people in the whole country. All right? So, in the dialogue, please consider how we can help cities to be part, to grow, and to learn from all the experiences. But remember that we have the extremes, large and very tiny, on uh, the opposite end. Terrific. Thank you. And fi our final comment. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Victor Bosz. I'm from Cape Verde. Uh, two or three comments. Oh, can uh, we please? Uh, two. Two. No, one and a half. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that cities are already playing this role. And uh, we must normatize this tension that can raise between central government and uh, city. Uh, city. These, these tensions exist also between government departments. So it's only normal and we need to normalize tension to live in peace with. Another point concerning uh, cities in Africa or in developing countries. Yes, cities must play an international role, but we cannot take the city from the rural areas, because they need food, they need water, they need a lot of things. And for city planners and for government planners, even if you want cities to play an international role, we need a holistic approach of rural areas and urban areas. Because in developing countries, most of the problems we have in cities, those problems, come from the failure in rural area, in rural development. So we need a global approach if we want city to play uh, 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 the role we want it to play. Just one comment. City is not an homogeneous space. In cities, you have neighborhood with a better quality of life, better service, and you have in the same city other, other cities. So it's, an, we, it's just Lisbon, but there is a lot of Lisbon in Lisbon. It's Buenos Aires, but I know in Buenos Aires, you have also a lot of Buenos Aires in the same city. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Uh, just want to wrap up. As, as everyone has said, this is a very, very important topic. And um, as the gentleman talked about solutions, as you wrap up in, in about 20 seconds each, why don't you talk about some solutions and any final thoughts? Solutions what, sorry? Uh, solutions to, to this problem of uh, the, the city as these uh, global players. And some well, I would wrap up with um, something. I, I don't like... Um, um, I don't like using concepts like smart city or uh, mega regions or whatever because they are just concepts and really uh, if you'd ask here all of us would have a different opinion of what is that concept. Okay, First, first point. Second point, um, when we talk about importance of cities we are not excluding rural areas or the rest of the countries of course. We are just saying that we have to give a different role to cities but that doesn't exclude all the others rural or uh, other players in the country or in the city. We are not excluding, we are just talking about a different role for the cities and I think that's important to say. Third, I don't know if we are on the smart city or not. I'm not worried about that. What I know is that, for instance, in six months, I have managed to rehabilitate a building that was shut down for 10 years in the center of Lisbon. I have there 140 new jobs. I have there 40 new enterprises, and I have managed to have there 3 million dollar, uh, euros being uh, factored. So that's what I know. And what I know is that I have to work to this. I don't know if it's smart or if it's not smart. I know that I'm working for people to have a better life. Thank you, Russell. Great. Art. Yeah, well, to wrap up for myself, I see that uh, for cities to have the opportunity to be smart cities, 
and the vibe is there, we need smart nations to give the opportunities for cities in governance and also in finance to do that. We should, however, recognize that once the cities get that freedom, so to say, it's no longer Barcelona to Madrid, because if you have the freedom, you see that Barcelona is in, in itself also a group with many, many different interests. So what looks now as a united city will then be a new, uh, new democratic area, and therefore we have to take care that the democratic, uh, democratic systems in cities is in many cities much weaker than it's in nations. So we need also media for that democratic. For the Bertelsmann Foundation, we do already since 12 years the Bertelsmann Transformation Index for countries. Maybe we have to consider to do a Bertelsmann Transformation Index for cities. That's a good idea. Uh, no, Berto. Uh, one of the last questions on the, the guiding questions of the panel said, uh, what's the benefit of global engagement uh, uh, and global participation? Uh, let me say that in a couple of, uh, of years, uh, uh, Buenos Aires has uh, developed uh, a niche strategy in order to participate in global value chains, and uh, mainly in what is related to cultural and creative industries. And we have had a, a, a huge impact in the uh, youth Sorry, sector in terms of employment. Uh, and, and I want to relate this with the, the Yao issues that, that they were posing uh, a couple of minutes because, uh, before, because Yao uh, is uh, the segment that uh, in unemployment rates at the global level are, are, are much higher. So I, I think that, that, that that's one point at least that I would like to stress. Thank you. Harry? Yeah. Uh, ik had gedacht om de laatste tien seconden gewoon in het Nederlands te gaan praten om een punt te maken wat jullie waarschijnlijk niet begrijpen. Uh, dat zie ik al in jullie gezichten. So what I did basically, I talked in my own language and nobody understood. So that's what the thing I pick out of these sessions. There are so many things we simply don't know on this planet. We simply don't know. We have so many great examples. So it is about connecting these things together. So the solution for this all is basically that we, these very important people here in this room, you know, we are very important people. That if we only go do one thing different next week, then we'll be, that will be a step. Because we are not going fast enough, it's not smart enough, and we are exhausting the planet. That will be my fleet. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Join me in thanking this fantastic panel. And John, thank you. That was really terrific. Um, for GMF, this was really a special uh, panel. Uh, our roots, uh, the first 20 years of GMF was focused on comparative urban work between the United States and Europe. We've been trying for the last 20 years to put on a panel at one of our major conferences that was this smart and this engaged. And it was really terrific. Thank you so much. You gain an hour tonight, fall back. Dinner is outside. Nine o'clock, we start night owl sessions. New partnerships in reinventing development policy at the Golden Fish, we've moved it. Much nicer room. U.S. elections 2012. I know not anybody is interested in it, but if you are, it's here in this big room. Uh, no, it's going to be a terrific session. And then finally, migration and labor mobility is in the Alwarda restaurant. So enjoy dinner tonight. We'll see you at the Night Owls at 9 and then tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And thank you again. <laughs>